Hi readers, Lee here. Welcome back to my ch channel, Lila Wanders and Reads. And today I'm drinking a large glass of brains. But welcome to my weekend books. My weekend books usually post on Monday, but Monday of this week was Veterans Day. So I'm posting this on Tuesday, recording it on Sunday. I love these long weekends, folks. There's going to be so many more, and then it's going to hit January, and it's going to be like, what do you mean I have to work five days a week? Anywho, um, so I had actually was going to give this another day before recording it, but I'm, I decided not to. Um, anywho, so let's talk about what I finished um, this week. I read from start to finish three books. I finished an audiobook, and I started... Um, Another audiobook, a not a nonfiction book, and a fiction book. All this week, Whew, I've been busy. So let's start with a book I talked about last week and cried. <laughs> Sorry, um, something lost, something gained. Reflections on life, love, love, and liberty by Hillary Rodham, Rodham Clinton. I started this on no on October twenty seventh, and I finished it on the third of November. And I'm not going to talk about the same things I talked about last week, not because I don't want to cry. Those parts were really moving to me. But I want to talk about something else um, in light of everything that's happened. So Hillary Clinton ends the book with, um, she talks about a volunteer from her campaign who's written a play called Suffs, which is about the 19th Amendment and the Suffragette, um, the suffragette Movement. And towards the end, she, she's talking about the play, a Broadway production. If I'm calling it a play and the actual word is Broadway production or something else like that, please forgive me. Um, I'm winging it here. And she talks, uh, so, and, and then she quotes an author, who I need to go look up now, who said that um, the women who launched the movement, the suffragette movement, were dead by the time it was completed. Um, and it's a never-ending fight. And so I really want to, you know, kind of close the book on this book with the end of Hillary Clinton's book and the paragraphs, the verse that she quotes from Suffs. I won't live to see the future that I fight for. Maybe no one gets to reach that perfect day. If the work is never over, then how do you keep marching anyway? Do you carry your banner as far as you can? Musical. That's what it is. It's a musical. Broadway musical, my bad. Do you carry your banner as far as you can, rewriting the world with your imperfect pen? Till the next stubborn girl picks it up in a picket line over and over again? And you join in the chorus of centuries chanting to her. The path will be twisted and risky and slow, but keep marching, keep marching. Will you fail or prevail? Well, you may never know, but keep marching, keep marching, because your ancestors are all the proof you need that progress is possible, not guaranteed. It will only be made if we keep marching, keep marching on. So that is from the Broadway musical Suffs. I do not know if I correctly attributed that. If I did not, I'm sorry, but really really glad I picked this up on audio I don't remember who how I got referred to it I know I had been aware of it but something I looked at or read made me pick this up and I'm so glad I did highly recommend it very timely very moving especially the parts about Afghanistan and her losing her mother and the fight for women's rights in this book Hillary Clinton over and over again lifts up other women and talks about other women. She does it in the Afghanistan part. Um, not so much her mother. That's a personal thing and that's appropriate. She talks about it, uh, you know, in all of these chapters, other women and lifting them up and making their lives better. So kudos to her. Let me have another sip of brains here. Now, as I've mentioned over and over in the past couple of weeks, it seems, and trust me, it's felt that way too. I have been so scattered. It's been pretty much 17, 17 days that I've been so scattered and unable to concentrate. And there's a couple reasons for it. One, one I'm still not really ready to talk about yet. 
One has been the election and the things going on in the world, and I just have trouble settling. I'm getting better now. Um, more so, I'm getting better in the evenings. Like, when I have a weekend off like this, a long weekend, I'm all over the fucking place. So, I, I can't settle because I've got time off, and I think I have all the time in the world. So, um, but in the evenings, it, I'm not, I'm getting back to where I can settle in the evenings, like I used to when I came home from work. But this weekend books, not quite there yet. So I started the week with The Lost Village by Camilla Sten. This was recommended by Mother Horror. She does weekly recommendations over on her Patreon. And this was recommended because it was... She used another phrase, but I want to say cold places. Because <laughs> this is set in, like, Sweden. Mm. And this is translated into English by Alexandra Fleming. I'm trying to get better at putting who translated these because translation and translating documents is such a job. It is so important. And I appreciate that every time I read translated literature. So I gave this three stars. It is not because it's not good. I think, again, I think I would have enjoyed it a lot more had it not been the certain time that I'm reading this. Um, and there was some places where I kind of had to suspend my disbelief, not in... I'm going to try to figure out a way to say this without spoiling. In the end, there's no evidence of what happened, so somebody's going to have some splaining to do, and it could look like people could get in trouble. I kind of would have liked to have seen that ending, but we're just supposed to accept that, oh yeah, you know, they're just going to believe what they told the police happened. So anyway, let's, let me tell you what this is about. Documentary filmmaker Alice Lindstedt has been obsessed with the vanishing residents of an old mining town dubbed the Lost Village since she was a little girl. In 1959, her grandmother's entire family disappeared in this mysterious tragedy, and ever since, the unanswered questions surrounding the only two people who were left, a woman stoned to death in the town center and an abandoned newborn, have plagued her. She's gathered a small crew of friends in the remote village to make a film about what really happened, but there will be no turning back. Not long after they set up camp, mysterious things begin to happen. Equipment is destroyed. People go missing. As doubt breeds fear and their very minds begin to crack, one thing becomes startlingly clear to Alice. They are not alone. They are looking for the truth, but what if it finds them first? Come find out. So, again, I probably would have really enjoyed this to at least three and a half stars, maybe four if it, no, three and a half for sure, if I had not been where I was in my headspace. Um, I loved that it had two timelines. So it talks about 1959 and it talks about now. Um, I love that there are some characters in here that are kind of fucked up. One is not really explained too well, and that was where I had a, an issue. Um, but again, I do recommend this book. If you like kind of atmospheric, gothic e horror, if you like anything about reality TV-ish, I do recommend this. And it felt really cold, which I like because it's been 80 degrees lately. Next up, I think I gave this book three stars also. Um, because at this point, nothing was going to get over three stars. I feel, again, ha I really liked this book. And had I been in a different headspace, this would have been four, maybe even four and a half. Because by the time I got what she was, by the time I could smell what she was stepping in, I was almost finished with the book. And I loved it. And it's, that was what started getting me, like, more excited. Because before, I was still kind of in my head and just unable to settle. And that is The Most by Jessica Anthony. Picked this book up on the at the bookstore on a whim. I think it might have been buy one, get one 50% off. Um, 
had no intention of buying it prior to when I bought it, had no intention of reading it. I was looking for a rom-com, and I saw this on the shelf, and I thought, oh, it's small, it's short, I'll just read this. And I thought that this may be something I read from my Mad Women project, and it kind of is, but it's it's also kind of really about female empowerment, although I did not realize it throughout most of the book. I really, really loved this book. I cannot tell you my favorite part. I could not tell you my favorite part. Dang, I did not, didn't I? Did I not? I didn't. I don't think I underlined my favorite part. I could have sworn I did. Oh, I did. I did. I just didn't tab it. Um, I can't read it to you because although it's hilarious, it is a huge spoiler. And I can't, I can't spoil it for you. Again, I gave this three stars on Goodreads. I may go back and change that. I may go back one day and reread this. I may go back this year and reread this when I'm in a 100% better headspace because now that I'm thinking about it, I really love it. I totally get what the title is about. I liked these people as characters, even though they're not really likable. But let me tell you about it. It is, it is an unseasonably warm Sunday in November 1957. Kathleen, a college tennis champion turned Delaware housewife, decides not to join her handsome hus husband Virgil and their two young boys at church. Instead, she takes a dip in the swimming pool of her family's apartment complex, and then she won't come out. Set over the course of eight hours, the most breaches the shimmering surface of a seemingly idyllic marriage, that's a tongue twister, immersing us in the unspoken truth beneath. Okay, this, this is an accurate blurb on the back. Um... A tale of sport in every sense of the word, of game and play, winning and losing, strategy and choice. If the secret of jazz, our male protagonist's hidden passion, is the notes they don't play, then the secret of this aching novel is the words the characters don't say to each other. I, yes, I loved this book. This may go back, this may go up on my favorite books of the year, because, not because of how I felt when I read it, but because how I felt after I read it. And that is true for me. If I keep thinking about something, that is like Hawk Mountain, which I loved. When I, if I keep thinking about something, that's when I know it really had, made an, had an influence on me. So. The next book, the third, that book that I finished that I started and finished, is not a good book. However, I think it was the comp... The, the... I think it was... I was starting to... The election was over. That was done. There's nothing I could do about that now. I was starting to get out of my weird headspace. And then I read this... And towards the end, it was like, okay, okay, I'm coming back, coming back to me. And then I read this, The Sound of Sleigh Bells by Janet Daly. And I picked this up at the grocery store. Nothing wrong with that. I've bought, there are great books at the grocery store. And this book got me all excited about reading again. And not, like I said, Two stars. It was not a good book. But this led me to a scandal, a mystery, a movie, which was about romance authors. And I am going to be doing 
a standalone video on this book and some other books by Janet Daly and Nora Roberts. I've got two books on order that won't arrive until Wednesday, so I don't know if I'll be able to finish them and get a video out by next week, but the week after for sure. Um, and I'm going to talk more about this book because you can see I've got a lot of tabs. This was um, terrible, and there's a reason it's terrible, and I, there's a reason I use air quotes around Janet Daly's name. But I don't want to spoil any of that right now. However, I stayed up late to finish this book because I had to finish it. Um, and it got me excited about reading again. And in the end, that's all that matters. Um, so I'll read what, to you what this is about, but I'm not going to put my thoughts in here. I'm going to save them. Oh, what the hell? I'll give you some thoughts. I'm not going to... Um, I'm going to save the spoilery bits for my longer email, my standalone, but let's just talk about this. Um, the writing was very simple. I felt like I could have written, this is something I wrote in college, um, I could have written in college. I found that the characters were very thin, very caricature-like, and um, there's no depth to any of them. They're just so flat and one-dimensional. Um, there's a shit ton of passive voice in here. And some archaic language. So, on two occasions at least, someone said, we mustn't. We mustn't this. We mustn't that. We mustn't try to move him without a stretcher. Who says that anymore? Nobody. Nobody says that. We're not British. We are American. We talk like shit. I mean, slang. We don't say that. We would say something completely different. And this is written in, in 2023 or 2020 something. So it's now. It's not 30, 40 years ago. Um, but I had a good time with it. No shade to Janet Daly. And I'll tell you why in my next, in my video that I do about this, no shade at all to Janet Daly. But that is all I'm going to say, except I will read the back of this. The premise of this was great. And, but at starting out, like page one, I'm like, ooh, ooh, like, could, I could write this. Um, and I thought this would be a great Christmas, but Christmas was kind of an afterthought in here. Um, the family who came for Christmas, it says in bold letters on the back. After her divorce, Ruth McCoy is eager to trade her children's painful memories for new holiday traditions. But Ruth has a whole new set of distractions when fate brings the man she loved, she once loved, together with the son he never knew he had. Dun dun dun. Life has thrown Judd Rankin some tough turns, and he's startled by the feelings he still has for Ruth. Though the successful rancher knows better than to chase old dreams, he doesn't mind lending the struggling single mom a hand. And when Judd sees Ruth's teenage son's interest in his custom saddle business, he's happy to let the boy help him build the harness for the Branding Irons Christmas sleigh. Long sentence. Besides, the kid reminds Judge, Judd of the young man he once was, a man who believed anything was possible. Powerless to deny the growing bond between her son and Judd, Ruth knows it's only a matter of time before her secret is discovered. But will the revelation shatter the tender feelings between her and Judd, or turn out to be her family's greatest gift? Anywho, this led me to, like I said, a lot of things. Um, well, let's see, let me write down what it led me to so I don't forget. It led me to, I had, there was a scandal... A mystery, a movie, and that was, I do not remember the name of it, and I don't have my phone here with me. You can look it up on Amazon. I think it was Amazon. I don't, I don't know. It could have been Amazon or something free that I didn't have to pay for, Pluto maybe. Um, but it was about romance novelist. I watched that yesterday, loved it, or the day before, it's a blur, loved it, and it, that led me to buying more books romance books, which I can't wait to read. Um, 
Scandal Mystery Movie. That's it. And more books. Like books tend to do. Alright, so that is it. That is the last book that I finished. I'm going to keep this out so that I um, can rem use this for my long form video on Janet Daly, the scandal, the mystery, etc. Um, and again, I'll let you know whenever that comes up. So, I thought I would be further in this than I am. It is not a difficult read, it, but I am, again, only reading it at night. Still a little bit distracted, but it's an easy read. I am reading it along with, on my phone, a little kind of BBC synopsis of what's going on, just to make sure I don't miss anything. I'm not at all. Um, the writing is very easy. The, the, the writing in another book that I'll show you in just a second is a lot more difficult than this. This is Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. I've not read this before. I wrote, I'm reading this for my Mad Women project and for my whole feminist shit pro project. And I'm, no regrets, I think it'll take me a couple more days to read this and I'll let you know what I think about it. Also, I am reading on the nonfiction side, the difficult book. I'm probably going to take a break from this today. I have to read 25 pages a day to get it finished by the end of November, and I'm, it is, it is hard. Oh, shit, I can't do that, because the next chapter starts with Jane, no, I can, it starts with Jane Austen, not Jane Eyre. So, there is something about Jane Eyre and about Charlotte Bronte in here, but this is called The Mad Woman in the, Mad Woman in the Attic, the women, the, the woman writer and the 19th century literary imagination. So yeah, I might skip today. It's already like one o'clock and I have not read any of it. Um, on the listening side, a viewer, thank you, I didn't catch your name, recommended Ghost Dogs by Andre Debuse III on Killers and Kin. I thought this was short stories. Apparently I did not pay attention when I picked it up. He also wrote House of Sand and Fog. I've not read that. It looks fantastic, though, but I ha I did not buy it. I thought about it, but I didn't. It doesn't go along with my Mad Women Feminist Ship Project. So, um, Ghost Dogs is actually not short stories. So, I'm going to read... I'm going to make a lot of noise and dip my chain into my coffee mug... So anyway, and then I'll get back to my, what I was talking about. So I started this thinking it was short stories. It's not short stories. It's more like essays. But when, once I've got accustomed to that fact and realized it was not what I was, was thinking it was, it's going a lot quicker for me, a lot better. During bright summers in Louisiana, Andre Debuse III's grandfather taught him that men's work is hard. As an adult, whether tracking down a drug lord in Mexico as a bounty hunter, I haven't got to that part yet, or grappling with privilege while living with a rich girlfriend in New York City, I have got to that part. He, he comes off like an asshole, but he, he owns it. Debuse worked at being a better worker and a better human being. In Ghost Dogs, Debuse's nonfiction prowess is on full disp display in his retelling of his own successes, failures, triumphs, and pain. In his longest essay, If I Owned a Gun, Debuse, Debuse, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, I don't care at this point, um, reflects on the empowerment and shame he felt in keeping a gun and his decision, ultimately, to give it up. Elsewhere, he writes of a violent youth and of settled domesticity and fatherhood about the omnipresent expectations and contradictions of masculinity, about the things writers remember and those they forget. Drawing upon kindred literary spirits from Rilke to Rume to Tim O'Brien, Ghost Dogs renders moments of personal revelation with emotional generosity and stylistic grace, ultimately standing as an essential witness to the work of living a good life and a testimony to the art of the essay. There is a part in here... Sorry, got to find my, my audiobook bookmark. So, 
There's a part in here that I'm not... It's called Carver and Debuse, where his father meets Raymond Car Carver in New York City in 1988. That was really kind of moving. Um, I really liked that. I am right now on a book called The Door. I'm going to go ahead and say I'm at the end of that. So... This is about where I am in Ghost Dogs. I've got still a good five hours left to go, probably closer to six. Um, but again, now that I understand what this is about, that this is essays about his life and his struggles, I'm really, I'm, I'm really enjoying it more because I understand what I'm getting into. Anywho, um, that is not all I have to say. <laughs> Fool Jeff. So, in the comments today, or yesterday, someone asked, someone made a comment on my cookbook haul and asked for more cookbook hauls. I might be able to accommodate that, but not as part of my regular schedule, maybe once a month, like a Saturday shorty, um, because I've got a ton of cookbooks, and a ton that I would recommend and I'd love to hear any recommendations because of course one can't have too many cookbooks so I'm considering doing that if that's something you're interested in Saturday shorties for cookbooks hey let me know down in the comments um in two weeks on the 25th of November I will hit the one year anniversary of my first published YouTube video so I am not sure what I'm going to do for that that's on my weekend books day it is also Thanksgiving week. Yes, Thanksgiving week. So, my very first video was a book haul. I may revisit that, although I'm not going to rehaul. I mean, I need to make find a way to make that unique because other people revisit their book hauls. I don't want to copy other people. Anywho, I'll figure it out. Um... That is all for me today on my week in books. I know I've been a little scattered over the past couple weeks. That's where my headspace is now. I'll get focused one day, surely. Um, thank you for sticking with me on this journey. Happy reading.